I'm going to start with um, something very interesting, which is the fact that I went out for a meal with a friend a few days ago. And we were sitting in a restaurant, very quiet place, very civilized, very German. <laughs> um, and then something very uncivilized happened. The door opened, and in walked a guy, a big guy, big shock of red hair on him, pale skin, and a certain type of accent, and I thought, well, this guy has to be Irish. <laughs> he sat down at the table just a few feet away from me, um, and he was followed immediately by um, another very tall person, but this time um, very elegant, very stylish, long blonde hair, and I thought, you know, I, I bet she's Swedish. Sorry about all these cultural stereotypes. Um, and one by one, they were joined by a number of other people who sat down at the table with them. And myself and my friend, we were having dinner, but um, we were talking relatively quietly, and this table next to us was very noisy, so I must confess we, out of interest and out of curiosity who these people were, we started in listening into their conversation a little bit. Um, and it turned out that these people had been exchange students a few years previously. They'd been exchange students, and they had come to Germany to learn German, to improve their university education. Um, and whether they'd done so or not, I'm not really sure, because most of the conversation was conducted in, that, in, a, in a smattering of uh, half German, half English, um, with various interesting accents. And they were very excited. It was obvious they had just arrived in town, and they were delighted about being here. So it was entertaining and fun to see how much energy was being expressed by these people. But then a few minutes later, something happened. We heard some beeping, and somebody picked out a mobile phone at this table. And then there was another beep, and somebody else picked out another mobile phone. And within uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes of these people having gathered together for an exciting moment, not having seen each other, obviously, for some time, and reuniting in the town where they had done their, um, where they had done their exchange year, they were all transfixed by their mobile phones. And I think it's a common occurrence. We see, that we see a lot of this. Um, it's human nature that we are, well, easily distracted. Um, and we're living in a world of increasing distractions and in a world of, well, diminishing attention spans. And that's a very big problem. Why is it a very big problem? Well, for a number of reasons, but not least because um, if we don't have the ability to keep our attention on something for very long, then it may affect our ability to engage with complicated things. So we can give ourselves some examples. Um, we look at the newspapers, or we used to look at the newspapers. I don't know whether newspapers still exist. I haven't seen one for a while. Um, and they would raise the serious issues of the day. Now we go online, and we're bombarded with different things, most of which are relatively trivial. Things like the lives of celebrities, um, the latest person in our society who's become outraged about something that may have affected their pride or honor or whatever, but that isn't serious in any meaningful sense of the word. This is problematic because this affects the fact that society is this way now affects the actions of people in power. What do I mean? Well, we have witnessed an amazing moment um, recently in our lifetime. The United States elected their first African-American president, which is something really incredible. I think a lot of people didn't see that coming. But, and it's a big but, what do we know about the Obama presidency as, as outsiders, as people a little bit further back, and hopefully as people with, with a certain ability to engage with the issues? What do we know? What do we remember about Obama? What did we, what did we hear when he was being elected? What were the messages that President Obama communicated to voters in order to get himself elected? Well, what I remember about the campaign was the words, yes, we can, and posters with hope and change which is great. It was all very powerful. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of positive energy. But it's a lot easier to say, yes, we can, than my policy runs thus. I plan to revolutionize the American healthcare system, do everything I can to engage with a hostile Republican Congress while disappointing the world on human rights issues and the use of drone strikes, surveillance technologies, etc. 
It doesn't quite have the same appeal as, yes, we can. But unfortunately, people don't have the patience to listen to things beyond, yes, we can, and hope, and change, and things are just going to get better generally. So, policymakers, decision makers, important people, they buy into this idea um, that people have short attention spans. I'm not saying it's entirely a new thing. There's always been, we've always loved a sound bite. You know, when we think about the French Revolution, we think liberté, égalité, fraternité. When we think about the American Revolution, we think about no taxation without representation. We think about um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is great. But I think we have experienced a change, and that change is that beyond the slogans, people are less aware of the issues behind them. People, people assess the issues behind the slogans with less of a critical eye, which is paradoxical because we're more educated than we've ever been. But because of all the distractions in the society, we don't have quite the same um, critical faculties that we maybe did even a generation ago, I would argue. But I didn't come here to talk about any of that. I came here to talk about human rights. Now, why are human rights important? How do they fit into this? Why human rights are important is, well, where, where will I start? I can, I've mentioned the French and American revolutions, but I'm actually going to start, as I say, about a generation ago. I'm going to start in 1977. A book called um, Taking Rights Seriously came out by a guy called Ronald Dvorkin, who some of you may know. And this book argued that rights are trumps. Rights are trumps. If you are playing a game of cards, the holding up a right is the trump card. It will trump any other interest. Now, what does this mean? Well, what it means is that in the old days, rules for governing society were fine because society was simple. But as society got progressively more and more complicated, things changed. Interests needed to be balanced. There were conflicts of rules. And achieving the maximum utility in the circumstances um, became one of the goals of society. The problem, of course, was that achieving the maximum utility in the circumstances could have very negative consequences for particular groups. Suppose you have a city, and the city has a very aging population. The aging population, um, they're taking up all the prime property, Next to, next to the places where the young people work um, in the center of the city. Providing services for these people is complicated, it's expensive, it's difficult. Um, well, some would say if a private developer comes along and offers to build a huge block of apartments somewhere outside the city, somewhere in the countryside, where all the old people can live, where all the um, services for the elderly will be provided on site, um, and therefore this will free up the property in the center of the city for young people, etc., etc., then the best thing to do is to relocate all the old people out to this block outside the city. But Dworkin's idea was, no, the idea of rights is that they can be held up as trumps. You can't send people out to the outside of the city without their consent. So people have a right to live where they want to. As a result, you can hold up this right as a trump against anybody who tries to move you. Great. Fantastic. This is excellent. This restricts what policy, policy makers can do. This restricts how our society can be governed, and it means that people can't be tread on. So these rights being held up as trumps is a very good concept. But there is a problem. And the problem is that, well, in reality, the rights as trumps idea can only be taken so far. Why? Because rights will inevitably come into conflict with other rights. A common example is um, if you have a strike outside a department store by the workers in that department store. Well, there's the conflicting right of the owner of the department store to um, dispose of his or her property and the strikers to strike. So we seek some sort of compromise. They can't strike on the premises where they work, but they can strike outside. We try to balance the rights. But the whole point about rights was that they were supposed to be held up to trump other interests. It wasn't supposed to be something that was just involved in this balancing act within society. Now, in the particular peculiar context of human rights, this has become progressively more and more of a problem. Why? Because this idea of rights as trumps is really seductive. 
if we believe that rights can be used as trumps to give us an interest that, it, that you can't argue with, that can trump other interests, well, in these circumstances, we will always seek to be on the side that possesses the trump card. We will always look for rights. This means that in recent generations, there has been a significant proliferation of rights. There has been an, well, a taking up of the human rights discourse by many groups, seeking to turn their interests into so-called human rights. I read a couple of papers the last few weeks um, by individuals arguing strongly and to some extent convincingly that there is a human right to broadband internet access. Human right to broadband internet access. Um, however, considering that human rights were originally supposed to be about protecting the right to life, prohibition on torture, the right to a fair trial, etc., etc., it's difficult to some extent to find this convincing. But the proliferation of rights, as I've said, it means that we have, um, we have conflicts of rights. We have conflicts between opposing rights. And therefore, we're back to where we were before we had rights. We're back to balancing. This balancing um, has been evident recently in a lot of Western countries where the debate on gay marriage has come up. So you have the idea of should somebody's freedom of religion allow them to oppose um, gay marriage, which amounts to a claim for um, sexual rights, equality, etc., etc. So there's a clash. This proliferation of rights can be seen as a good thing. It can be seen as including um, more interests into this protected trump card sphere. But it can also be seen as a bad thing. And I think we have to um, realize that while this proliferation of rights has gone on, many of the significant issues that human rights were devised to deal with have not been dealt with. And part of this is due to our proliferation, our, our, the, the, the multiplication of the numbers of human rights. I'll take one fairly topical example. We can look at the prison system in the United States, the, the incarceration, the justice system in the United States. So we're not talking about some ungovernable country in God knows where. We're talking about a rich Western democracy. The United States now incarcerates 2.3 million individuals. Incarcerates over 10 times as many prisoners now as it did 20 years ago. Some statisticians say that the United States now incarcerates a higher proportion, a proportion of its population than any peacetime society in the history of mankind. This is a human rights issue. Capital letters. Other things to say? Well, of these 2.3 million prisoners, as you might imagine, they are disproportionately poor and they are disproportionately black. If we look at the statistics regarding the US justice system, we also find certain anomalies. Death row, for example. Who goes on death row? Well, again, poor black males. But it's not necessarily just because they commit more murders or heinous crimes. You are 22 times more likely to be convicted of murder and sentenced to death if you are a black person who kills a white person as the other way around. 22 times more likely statistically. So this is a big human rights issue. This is right to a fair trial. This is due process, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, well, there are human rights advocates. There are groups trying to deal with these issues. That's clear, and it's great that there are. But in the world of proliferation of human rights, the world of um, multiple human rights, and the world of short attention spans, our soundbite generation is not able necessarily to deal with these issues because there's so much other stuff out there. Um, rather, policymakers come up with slogans like um, the war on drugs or um, the three strikes rule. The three strikes rule, incidentally, for those of you who are not aware, is a, um, is a rule in certain American states whereby if you th commit three felony crimes, you will be automatically incarcerated for the rest of your life in jail. The three strikes rule and the war on drugs put a lot of people into jail. But this ignores the fact that a lot of these people who were put in jail are not a danger to society. 
And they never were and they never will be. They've been convicted on petty drugs offenses. They've been convicted of different things that may have caused no danger to society. But they will spend a lot of their lives or the rest of their lives in prison. This is a real human rights issue. But the proliferation of human rights, the proliferation of human rights discourse, it dilutes the seriousness of it. And we have become a society that is experiencing something of a malaise with human rights. People are sick of hearing human rights. And there's always some part of human rights with which you, don't, you won't agree. If you're a strong proponent of freedom of, 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 of freedom of religious expression, then you will defend the right of religious groups to oppose gay marriage. If you're a strong proponent of equality, then you will say, no, gay marriage is absolutely fine and these people should not be able to have their say necessarily. They shouldn't be able to oppose it. They shouldn't be able to stop it from happening. The proliferation of human rights the dilute, dilutes the power of human rights. And who benefits? Well, maybe gay advocacy groups benefit from the fact that they make gay marriage a human rights issue. Maybe they do. But who else benefits? Well, for example, private operators in prison, of prisons in the United States benefit. The United States economy has benefited massively from the <coughs> Increasing use of prison labor. How is this? Why is this? Well, increasing use of prison labor has meant that they can pay prisoners 25 cents an hour to work and win contracts that would have gone previously to third world economies, to Mexico, etc., etc. So this is fueling the United States economy. This is helping people who are unscrupulous and who are supporting measures to put more and more non-dangerous people into prison. So this is how our society is changing. And this is, ha this is not necessarily a positive development. But there is something we can do about it. How can we change things? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that we are society. We have the power. I don't think we are going to ever gain, regain a society where people have a longer attention span. I don't think we're ever going to get people to listen attentively for more than 18 minutes to anything. <laughs> but even if we're living in a soundbite society, we should restrict our discourse. If we're going to use the words human rights, they should have power. They should be restricted to the extreme cases where people are having their right to a fair trial, right to due process, their right to life, the right not to be tortured, threatened. We should restrict our conception of human rights. We should be careful about when we use these words. And if we can manage to make a change in society where we challenge people we challenge people who make issues that are not really necessarily about core human rights into a human rights discourse. If we challenge that, then we may get back to a society where when the words human rights are used, they have real power and they have the power to shock. They have the power to make people stop and think. And if we do that, I think we may get back to a position where human rights can actually still be held up as Trump's to stop government from pursuing policies that really harm people. Thank you.